Hello and welcome to Street Check, the weekly podcast from Cabot Wealth Network, which has been publishing uh, investing research insights and recommendations since 1970. I'm Chris Preston, Cabot's Vice President of Content and Chief Analyst of Cabot Stock of the Week. And I'm Brad Simmerman, Managing Editor of the Cabot Wealth Daily and the Chief Analyst there. Uh, we've got a special show for you today. We had a guest on, Matthew Tuttle, the CEO and CIO, uh, Chief Investing Officer of Tuttle Capital Management rose to prominence for his short ARK Innovation Fund and recently launched an inverse Kramer Fund. So we'll have a, a nice conversation with him at the end of the podcast today. Before we get to that, though, we're going to, of course, cover our big three subjects, the most pressing news items of the week. This week, we're going to talk retail spending and the state of the consumer. We'll talk the debt ceiling. What will it take for that to start imposing pain on the markets? And did we start a new bull market? Are we are we facing the wall of worry? But before we get there, as always, we defend the take with the hottest, wildest takes on the street. Yep. And it's my turn this week. Uh, but Brad, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up yours from last week. Uh, yours from last week was um, that the S&P will dip below four, uh, yes, 4,000 before it rises above 4,200. At the time, it was right above 4,100, I think. Well, um, it's risen above 4,200. So it might be record time for a, a defense <laughs> take going awry. Um, it hasn't closed above 4,200. And in fact, it doesn't look like it will today. Um, your thoughts? Okay. So I'm going to address the audience directly. This segment is called <laughs> Defend apology? the Take. <laughs> okay. No apology. Okay. It's, it's not an excuse. It's an explanation. Uh, it is defend the take. We have to pick hot takes. I thought it was a perfectly reasonable one, given the range bound trade sort of oscillating around the moving average um, at the center of those Bollinger Bands. Two, as you said, it didn't close above 4,200 yet. So I, I hear you use this as a technicality. You brought it up. I, <laughs> defi definitionally, I'm not wrong yet. Yeah. Uh, and, and you're lucky we're recording this midday on Friday. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Def definitely. And worst case, we'll just reach out to Matthew and see if he'll launch a short Zimmerman fund if I end up being the contraindicator of Cabot. That, that's funny you mentioned that. I, I was telling uh, Jacob Mintz, our Jacob Mintz, uh, options trading expert and uh, and Brad Zimmerman troll. Uh, he said, <laughs> you got to bring up there should be uh, there should be a Brad Zimmerman uh, short short selling fund. So you beat him to the punch. Oh, nice. Well, that silver lining to a uh, terrible, terrible take. But I actually, uh, full. if I'm being honest, I agreed with your take. And I, I don't think you're going to be that far off, especially if the debt ceiling, we'll, we'll get into the debt ceiling stuff. But yeah, as we get yeah, close to the debt ceiling, I think you're not going to be far off. The market still has overhead resistance to chew through. Maybe it gets rejected at 4,200 and heads back down. Maybe it, this is where it breaks out, right? We'll, that, we'll touch on that with the wall of worry stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah we'll but that. trying to get things back on track this week, Chris, you will be defending a take. Your take, Bitcoin over 40,000 before oil breaks $100 a barrel. You have 90 seconds. Go. Okay, so Bitcoin now at twenty seven thousand, uh, oil around seventy two dollars a barrel. So both have a ways to go. Bitcoin it would be it would take a fifty percent rise, forty nine fifty percent rise. Uh, oil would be more like thirty eight thirty nine percent. This stemmed from um, so beginning of the year. Here are some headlines. Uh, actually, no, December. Bank of America uh, prices. Uh, this is when oil prices were at seventy seven seventy eight dollars a, bar a barrel. Uh, oil prices will average above $100 a barrel this year. Um, they'll click, quickly motor past $90 on China's reopening. Russian supply is dwindling. Um, Eric uh, Natel of um, Nine Point Partners, uh, $100, $100 a barrel will return in 2023 in an interview with the Financial Post. So there are a lot of people calling for $100, you know, $100 a barrel uh, in, in short order. Um, a lot of doomsayers out there. Well, oil is down 10% year to date, lower than it was in December. Bitcoin, on the other hand, is up uh, 62%. I'm not a big Bitcoin guy in general, but Bitcoin is a bull market play, I think. And I think we're, as we'll discuss later, I think we're at the beginning stages of a bull market 
uh, the next bull market. And that's why I think it has a better chance to go up the rest of the year than oil does. All right, that's snuck in right under the wire. Great. Yeah, um, when you proposed the take, I didn't see the connection at first, but once you started referencing those headlines, it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, those definitely warrant a response. And I think it's a, a perfectly reasonable take. Right, and let me say, oil uh, clearly, well, at least it's clear to me, uh, has way more utility <laughs> in today's society <laughs> than Bitcoin. Um, so long-term, you know, oil at least is, is more stable and more reliable resource. Bitcoin, Bitcoin goes with the market, I think. Um, you know, not surprising that it got crushed the last year and a half when the market was down. Um, but now it's having a resurgence, um, still well below its highs. It's peaked at 65,000 in November 2021, which lo and behold was the top of the NASDAQ. Um, and you know, now it's all the way down to 27,000 range. So, uh, but I think it'll get to 40,000 before oil gets to hundred dollars a barrel. It, uh, funny, I just saw Bank of America updated its its forecast. Now they're saying $95 by the year end of the year after saying average of hundred dollar for the whole year. So they're still, they're not giving up on, on oil, but um, I am. All right. So I'm drive watching. drive as much as you want this summer. I know there's usually a spike in oil prices, but it's not going to be $120 a barrel like it was last June. It was hundred, still $100 a barrel last July, um, which people may forget at this point, but yeah. uh, it wasn't that long. I mean, my, my gas prices have not come down from five bucks a gallon since inflation five? started getting reined in. Yeah. Wow. So. Yeah. Ours are in Vermont or below three in the threes. I think like high threes. I don't know. Can't remember. I would drive just to burn fuel if I could pay three dollars a gallon. I'd just take take an extra couple of laps around the neighborhood just for the joy of a low cost driving. But let's move on. Yeah. First of our big three today, state of the consumer. What did retail sales tell us? So retail sales this month came out. Uh, I'm sorry, reported this month for April came out 0.4 percent higher, which is Roughly fully explained by inflation, core inflation also up 0.4%. Home Depot reported earnings uh, that indicated that house that home that home improvement spending was likely to slow for the rest of the year. So are are consumers finally feeling the pinch? My take is this, uh, which I've shared with you. I, I think you know we've seen. Uh, like Home Depot tank the other day, uh, which ties into your, you know, new home constructions uh, being down, um, although Walmart was up. Um, I think it's become in, in the wake of COVID, post-COVID world, which let's say it's last year, basically, it's become more of an experiences market, travel, casinos, cruises, airlines, hotels, um, those are all up. I mean, anytime, if you've traveled in the last year, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, and in a products, a things market, that was that spiked during COVID when we couldn't go anywhere. We were ordering everything online. Um, and then even right after, you know, some of the COVID restrictions are lifted and you go to stores, people, you know, were out in droves then too. Um, so I think it's just been a shift. Um, but you seem to think you, you, you think a little bit more, it's a little bit more of a recession red flag, right? I, I think it could be. Um, be no. So there, the sort of dueling narratives right now are there's a recession coming and we're not in it, or there's a rolling recession, or as Bruce alluded, Bruce Kayser alluded to last week of Cabot Value Investor, a uh, an inventory cycle where recession is hitting different segments of the economy at once. Um, I do think you can make a case that travel spend is elevated because consumers have been trapped inside for the last two to three years, depending on their approach to the pandemic. So if you're going to endure a little bit of financial pain to get to this pent up travel demand to, to satisfy that, I think you're maybe more willing to do so. So I, I'm not ready to say that, uh, you know, the consumer is here to save the American economy again. I, but I do think that it's indicating that they're feeling maybe more pain than the rest of the financial headlines might might indicate. Yeah. And this is why you're you're seeing more um you know casino related stocks, cruise related stocks in some of the cabinet advisories than some of the retail stocks that did so well 
you know, first first few months of this year. Um, is, yeah, Royal, is, Royal Caribbean reported record bookings uh, yeah. in their most recent quarterly earnings. So the spend is there. It's just, is it a spend that's coming from a place of like stability and, and safety? Or is it a spend that's coming from a place of willingness to, to take a, a hit to the bank account? just because you've been stuck in your house for three years. I, I would lean maybe more towards the, the latter than the former, but um, but I, I think for investors, that sort of makes a case for some of those, those experienced companies, your MGMs, your Vegas Sands, right? CCL, Carnival, Norwegian. So the, and probably the airlines too. Um, yeah. So I, I think there's still an opportunity to make money in the market even if the consumer is feeling more pain than we think. Right. Um, okay, let's move on to number two in our big three, and that's the debt ceiling. Um, it's the elephant in the room right now. Um, so we're, we are we uh, are filming this, recording this uh, about midday uh, Eastern time, a little afternoon Eastern time. Um, you know, debt ceiling had some momentum earlier in the week, uh, which has been helping stocks uh, get above that 4200 level the s p get above that 4200 level but uh right before we came on their stock started to fall because they're um one of the republicans top negotiators uh garrett graves a uh, republican from louisiana came out and said that it's time to pause um on the negotiations and it seems like there's a bit of a stalemate so we're getting closer to the deadline which is early june it's not like a hard deadline it doesn't seem um, at what point do you think things will break down? How, how close to that deadline do you think we need to get for the things to break down and for fear to really seep in? I, I, I don't know that it's a measure of time as much as it is proximity, yeah. right? If, if we keep getting headlines that, oh, Biden's open to negotiating, Republicans have conceded this point, as long as we've got a pathway to a debt ceiling hike. I think we can probably avoid some of the, the selling pressure we saw in like 2011, for instance, where the debt ceiling became a, a pretty big market driver. Um, if we are approaching maybe that last week in May and we're at the same spot that we are now, I think market feels it. Or alternatively, if we get a headline that comes out where it's, you know, Kevin McCarthy has stopped negotiations, refuses to step foot on the White House lawn until Biden fires every teacher, whatever, whatever <laughs> the demands are. I don't know what they are, but yeah. I, I think we need clarity that we're not on the right path. For now, the market can be like, all right, we're, we're on the right path. We're heading there. Um, you know, we're coming off of a pretty significant bear market. So it's not like people are eager to sell anyway. Uh, so yeah. I, I think we can maybe land this plane. Yeah, it, it seems like the market's sort of taking a innocent until proven guilty approach. Like, you know, we're we're just going to assume this is going to get done like it did in 2011. Um, you know, I mentioned last week, 2011, it was about 10 days before a deal got done. And that granted that um, the limit, uh, the sorry, the deadline had been pushed back a few times. That was when panic seeped in. Market fell 11% in those 10 days until the deal was done. And then another 5% after the deal was done. So, you know, I could see something like that happening, uh, maybe less extreme, but um, yeah, right now it seems like news dependent, which is why we saw this pullback, you know, sort of a yeah. abrupt mini pullback today. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so, it's, it's not there. It's not like the negotiating positions have changed or people are looking for anything right. different. It's just a, a little bit of a, a change in optics around it. Yeah. Um, I think... So one of the things that I will say about politics, which we don't really get into, is that the most reactionary sort of wings of either party tend to fall in line when the rubber hits the road, yeah. right? If we're staring down the barrel of an actual default on U.S. debt that could cripple global financial markets, it could kill regional banks, it, like who knows how what happens? I think a lot yeah. of the more vocal parties uh, maybe sit back down and let the adults in the room do the serious negotiating. That's that's my hope, at least. Yeah. And the real surprise would have been if today they came out of that meeting and said, hey, we have a deal because yeah. you know, we know that uh, Capitol Hill loves to procrastinate. Um, OK, uh, moving on to number three in our big three. Um, you mentioned at the beginning, are we climbing a wall of worry? What that means is so stocks have been moving slowly up 
upwards since um, you could go back to even all the way back to the October bottom, at least in the S and P. Um, you know, December also was another bottom, but there have been six different. I counted six different lows, new lows since October, and they've all been higher every single time. Um, and you know, there's the old saying: uh, stocks climb a wall, a wall of worry. Is the new bull bar market did it actually start back in well December, October, basically back in late fall, early early winter? Yeah, I I, I hate to say it, but yeah, I think so. Um, so Michael Brush, the chief analyst of Cabot Cannabis Investor, um, spoke up in a meeting recently and said, "This is a picture perfect bull market. We had a, a new defining low in October." It set a new higher low in, uh, I'm sorry, new, we had a defining low in December, set a new higher low in October, and the market has been trending higher. It hasn't been pretty. It's been doing it in a choppy fashion, but technically we're in an uptrend right now, at least on, you know, like a daily chart. Um, and the thing that resonated with me is the, the market, the market climbing the wall of worry is it's going up when you don't think it should be, and you're worried that it's a, a fake out. Right? right. And that's that's definitely how it feels. So I, I think you can make a compelling case that those December lows marked the end of the bear and then the October lows maybe marked the beginning or at least the confirmation of a of a new bull run. Um, look, obviously, if we have a default that slams the rally shut. Right. There's nothing there's nothing we can do there. But right. yeah. If the Fed signals that they're out of the way, if we get a, a positive resolution to the debt ceiling issues, then yeah, why? What's stopping people? Everybody's just sitting on cash in the sidelines, except for for retail. So there's nothing to stop the market from moving higher when it decides that it wants to. Yeah, I mean, if form holds, we probably will have another new low, or sorry, not new low, another low, but it'll probably be higher than the previous low. Um, but again. That ceiling deal, if it doesn't get yeah. done, that throws all of that out the window. Yeah, but if the market confidently uh, refutes my my forty two hundred ceiling and and gets through the overhead resistance there, then it's it's price discovery again, and and who knows? It could be a significant run up. Everybody is waiting for something to signal that it's okay to buy again. Right. Okay. Um, so. Before we move on to our guest, a couple of things I wanted to mention. Uh, first, I wanted to give an update on uh, the stock picks that you, uh, me, Tyler London, uh, who is chief analyst of our uh, Cabot Early Opportunities and Cabot Small Cap Confidential Advisories, and Mike Santolo, um, who run, who's our chief investing strategist and runs our Cabot Growth Investor and Cabot Top 10 Trader Advisories. They were both guests on our podcast two weeks ago. And we do this exercise. We all picked one stock that we think will do well for the next month. A month is pretty arbitrary, but I figured it'd be a fun you know, segment to do. And the four picks we've made, I'm happy to report two weeks in, have all outperformed the market thus far. Market S&P is up 1.8% in those two weeks. Um, pulling up the rear is me with uh, BYDDY. That's the Chinese electric vehicle. BYD is the name of the company. BYD Dui is the uh, Chinese ADR. Um, that's up 3.3%. Um, uh, Brad, you picked uh, Novo Nordisk, uh, NVO, which uh, is up 4.3% since. And Mike's pick, Uber, is about the same, 4.4%. But Tyler's blowing us all out of the water with Duolingo, D U O L. Uh, up 20%, 20% on earnings um, in those two weeks. Any thoughts there? I just don't, well. want, I don't want to hear any more 4,200 chirping from you since you're, you're coming in, you're coming in last. So that's right. If Tyler, yeah, if, Tyler or Mar if Tyler or Mike want to criticize my 4,200 call, they're welcome to, but you can zip it. Okay. Well, that, the, the stats may have changed in the hour since I uh, reported them. Uh, so it's, you know, I'm within one percentage point of view. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll see where it is at the end of the month. Um, okay. Tyler's probably going to beat us all. Um, okay. And uh, last thing I wanted to mention before, Brad, I'll in introduce our guest. Um, you know, as we mentioned last week, uh, it's a new podcast and we're trying to get, uh, build up as much of an audience as possible. So 
you can help us by subscribing, giving us a five-star five rating if you think it warrants it, uh, leaving us a nice comment. Um, you know, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, hit the like button. All of it, all of it helps us, yeah. all of it helps, helps build our audience. Um, and just wanted to mention that uh, for, if you like the podcast, that's how we keep it going. Yes, yeah, smash that subscribe button, peeps. Um, on a more serious note, uh, we're going to go ahead and transition to our interview with uh, Mr. Tuttle, the CEO, CIO of Tuttle Capital Management. Um, we're going to talk the short arc fund, a little bit of his history, and uh, the recently launched inverse Kramer and long Kramer portfolios. And um, he's going to also share some places where you can get more of his content, KramerETFs.com, TuttleCap.com, and then you can follow Tuttle Capital on Twitter. So uh, let's throw it to Matthew Tuttle. So today we're welcoming on Matthew Tuttle of Tuttle Capital Management, who rose to prominence, uh, at least in my mind, for the short ARC fund, the ARC Innovation ETF, as well as some pretty interesting takes on the ETF marketplace in general. Uh, Matthew, thanks for coming on. And if you wouldn't mind, can you take some time to just explain uh, what your role is as the CEO and CIO of Tuttle Capital, a little bit about your background and then a little bit about the company as well. Yeah, so, and, and thank you for having me. So I've been in financial services in one way, shape or form since 1990, uh, brokerage firms, insurance companies, wealth management. In 2015, we started launching ETFs. And, you know, I've also been trading my own account since the early 80s. So, you know, I like to launch ETFs that I want to own and that I want to trade. So you mentioned SARC, which is what really kind of thrust us on the radar screen. You know, to me, that was an ETF I wanted to trade. You know, A, at the time, I thought the market was primed to go down. And B, I'm a huge believer that, you know, if the market does go down, you'd rather be short you know, the stuff that Kathy owns than you would be, you know, Amazon, Microsoft, all of that. So, you know, I kind of run a lot of the day-to-day -day investment decisions among the ETFs we have. And, you know, I'm always working on new products. We've got a bunch of stuff in the pipeline. Uh, you know, this is going to be a really busy year. Yeah, I, I can... You're Sorry, I was going to say your timing on launching uh, <laughs> Sark was pretty impeccable. It was it November 2021? Is that right? right it was no, it was November, and so it launched at 30. It had one trade at 29.95 and never looked back. Nice. Unfortunately for me, I, I bought a bunch at 30, and then I was going to buy dips, and you know I had more to my position, and it never dipped. Uh, you know, normally if it was something else, I would just, I, you know, I'd look for spots and buy it, but I didn't want to curse it. So I never bought any more. I mean, now I trade it all the time, but I never bought any more than my initial position, which was somewhat unfortunate, but yeah. yeah. Good problem to have as a fund manager, bad problem to have as a trader, I guess. A exactly. <laughs> so uh, the reason that, that we're speaking, that we're on our radar is, is, or that you're on our radar is Kismet. You took the time to respond to an article that I had written in December uh, following the prospectus filing of the short Kramer and long Kramer funds, but during the quiet period uh, when you couldn't respond to it. So yeah. uh, you reached out and, um, and highlighted some uh, explanations for a little bit of a performance gap with the inverse SARK, uh, as well as an explanation for a lot of that legalese that's in there. Uh, one thing that I was really interested in is how it got on your radar, because Inverse Kramer was a meme for me as far back as like 2008. I was a broker with Schwab, so we would just see Kramer on his show and it'd be like, all right, here's the Kramer curse. It became a very online meme, got to be popular among the Wall Street bets Reddit crowd. Uh, what was your impetus to, to launch the fund? So, yeah, and again, I've been in markets for a long time. And one of the things that never changes, and so much changes about the markets, but one thing that never does is the consensus is almost always wrong. And Jim Cramer is the consensus on steroids. So, yeah, you, you know, you hear about him from time to time. The Bear Stearns call was epic. 
you know, other stuff and, you know, and, and I've always been very, I, I'm, I'm looking for the word, but not a fan of the financial media because, you know, I'm a big believer that individual investors need to be educated. Wall Street can be an unkind place if you don't know what you're doing. And, you know, where do you go for education? Oh, you turn on the TV, oh, CNBC, we got this, we got that. So, I mean, that stuff has always really made me mad. Um, but I've always also looked for, how do I take advantage of the fact that the consensus is usually wrong? And just Kramer became the obvious choice because he's got to swing at every pitch. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether he knows something about a group of stocks or not, certainly you, you keep hitting him with names, you're going to be talking about names he doesn't know. And, you know, and he keeps having these epically wrong calls. Yeah, I mean, Silvergate Bank and, you know, Bitcoin and, you know, on and on and on. It just never stops. So that, that actually leads me to a, a question that I was interested in asking you. How, how do you manage it? Because it's right. So like in the news media, the the fire hose of information, right? It's all noise. It's all noise. It's no, all noise. How do you pick the signal out when Kramer is throwing stuff out there left and right? So, yeah, and, and I've had to evolve on that. When we first kind of came up with the idea, I decided, you know, hey, I'm going to run it like an index fund. So everything that comes out of his mouth, if there's a buy, buy, buy or sell, 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 that's actionable. Mm -hmm. With the understanding that every day he's given you a lot of names. And so we were going to have to, you know, cycle through everything pretty much on a weekly basis and sometimes even, you know, more than that. And the Silicon Valley Bank call really pissed me off because, <laughs> you know, he made that call a couple of months before we launched and we were running the fund you know, on paper. So Silicon Valley on paper went into the fund as a short, but then a week later it had to come out because we had to replace it with a new name. And if all I was was an index guy, I mean, it is what it is, but I'm a trader. And when the retail bank crisis started, I wasn't short Silicon Valley, but I was short a bunch of them. And, you know, I wrote signature down to zero and, you know, made a lot of money in a lot of these banks. So I knew what was going on but I had no mechanism to go back and say, hey, he was positive on Silicon Valley, let's short it now. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of morphed on how we do it, where everything he mentions goes on a watch list, you know, either as a potential long or a potential short. And then we're picking from that watch list on a daily basis based on, you know, what we know, what's going on in the marketplace. Because the other thing I want is I want a concentrated portfolio. So like, you know, for Elgin, which is the long side, I don't want to get more than 25 names in there. S Jim, which is the long and short side, I don't want more than 30 names in there. So really to do that, we've got to use a watch list approach. And so, you know, we're looking at the market, we're looking at the calls, we're looking at the chart patterns, and that's how we're making the decisions. And this is something that that anybody can see if they go to KramerETFs.com. You have a, a daily uh, alert sign up where people can get a list of the actions that the funds have taken. Is that right? That is correct. Plus, being an ETF, you see our holdings, you know, as of 930 in the morning when the market opens. Mm -hmm. are, are there any uh, so, since you went public with with these funds? Have there been any Kramer picks that have really stood out or have, have moved the needle for you so far? Yeah, I mean, there, there, there have definitely been a few. So Western Alliance Bank yep. is, you know, one of the banks he's been on. Uh, Banco Santer is another one. You know, mm -hmm. he, he got on that one right after Credit Suisse was having trouble. Um, we've done great on Palantir, both in, in both funds, because he flip-flopped on it. So, you know, those are the names that really stand out. And I, I think the areas where we've made the most profit. And have you heard from Jim Cramer or anyone from his camp at all since you launched these? So when we filed, we definitely did. Um, you know, he <laughs> couldn't shut up about it. Interestingly, the day we launched, so he takes a lot of vacation. But when he takes vacation, it's Monday to Friday. We launched on a Thursday. He was on vacation that day. 
for a couple of days. I am told that's not a coincidence. Um, <laughs> so, and, and he has not said a word about it. Um, I do frequently poke him on Twitter. I mean, I try to be respectful, but you know, a little poke here and there, you know, haven't heard a response, hasn't blocked me either, which is somewhat interesting. I, I get people hitting me up. Like, How have you not been blocked yet? I don't know. <laughs> Kudos to Kramer for having thick skin. I mean, one thing that I, my stance with Kramer has always been like, uh, you know, he's an entertainer first, right? You don't transcend the financial media and then get to actual celebrity. You know, people would I would be able to identify him on the street without being very loud and, and very much front of mind for people all the time. Uh, but that's a tough way to run a fund or tough, right, tough way to run an investment portfolio if you have to make huge calls every time. Right. And, and, yeah, and I have great respect for him. And I, I understand he's an entertainer. He's not a stock market market guru. What makes me mad is how he's presented because yeah. he's presented as a stock market guru every morning. Hey, we're going to bring Jim on and get Jim's take. And there's no accountability. There has been a little lately. And I think, you know, maybe sort of, kind of, I have something to do with it. Like, you know, when he came out and said he was wrong about Facebook or Meta, I can never call it Meta, but <laughs> wrong about Meta. Um, and then, of course, he was wrong about Meta because it zoomed back up. But, you know, and David Faber, every once in a while, will say something. I'll be like, oh, wow, I can't believe David just said that. And it's usually subtle. It's never kind of in his face. But, you know, you can tell David sitting there sometimes thinking like, you know, what, what, what are you talking about? But that's what really makes me mad is you're an individual investor. You're sitting there. They're bringing him on as an expert. And you're looking at these calls and thinking, great. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm getting inside information and, and you're not. You're getting entertainment. Yeah. And my understanding is that Kramer's got to pay. The only way to access what he's actively investing in is through his paid service. So he's coming out and making a ton of, of public calls that are super high visibility, but then the actual actionable things that he's doing are behind a paywall. So I I, I get it. You you very much align with, with where Cabot stands on educating investors. So I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think it's huge. And, and we put out a ton of content. I mean, I do a daily educational newsletter. You know, I'm always trying to do podcasts, do stuff on Twitter. Uh, you know, all sorts of things. I think education is huge. So where where can people find that other than KramerETFs.com? Is that the best place for them to go to see your newsletter too? So I, I, you can sign up for our daily newsletter on that. I also have our corporate website, TuttleCap.com. And again, I'm, I'm active on Twitter at Tuttle Capital. Uh, I try to post educational stuff on Twitter in between, you know, trolling Kramer. Uh, you know, I don't always get to it, but yeah, you know, I, I try as much as I can. <laughs> um, just uh, one quick question before I let you go. Um, so you uh, see, you also have also have a fund that um, shorts specs. Um, did was short selling primarily your your background prior to launching these ETFs, or did it just sort of work out that way? Yeah, no, it it just worked out that way. You know, yeah. so the fund you're talking about is actually shorting D SPACs. So we were we were involved. We launched the first actively managed pre-merger SPAC ETF. And then we saw these things starting to de-SPAC. Mm -hmm. And you saw a lot of awful, I mean, awful, awful names. Yep. And we said, you know what, we, we got to short these. And, you know, in with Kathy Wood, she already had the long side. We wanted a short side. I mean, she's always out there saying she's the new NASDAQ. <laughs> I disagree. But if she is an index, every index has a long side and a short side. So, you know, we took the short side of that. Right. Well, Matthew, we really appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us, um, Brad, unless you have any any last questions or comments. No. No, yeah. I, I really appreciate your perspective on all this. Uh, speaking for myself, welcome back anytime. I uh, can't speak for Chris on that, but I assume yeah, based definitely. on how this has gone, that he'd be happy with that too. Yeah, uh, awesome. Check out KramerETFs.com, TuttleCap.com, 
And uh, Tuttle Capital or Tuttle Cap on Twitter? Uh, Tuttle Capital on Twitter. Excellent. Well, thanks for joining us. All right. Thanks for having me.